check, check, okay. Ready to go? Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. The, the, this is a paradox class of July 10th, 2020. Um, Hugh's going to be speaking today. Let me t have some announcements for uh, the next couple weeks, next few weeks. We got Ken samples next week on the on July 17th. Um, Hugh's going to be back on the 24th, and then on the 24th, on the 31st, uh, the speaker is going to be a guest speaker to be determined. So, um, Hugh is going to be speaking. He's starting a new, um, a new session or a new, uh, a new series. That's the word. Okay, on design to the core. So, um, well, let's welcome Hugh Ross. now it says I'm on yeah. okay good thank you yeah just to reiterate uh, Ken samples will be here next week uh, to do part two of his series on evidence for the rights of resurrection and he'll be back on the 31st uh, the 31st I'll be speaking at the American scientific affiliation and they got me speaking Sunday so uh, Ken will be taking that role and uh, as announced I'm launching a new series uh, starting this Sunday, and uh, here's the theme, Building a Stronger Fine-Tuning Argument for God. Uh, in one sense, it's uh, some snippets from my latest book, Design to the Core, and uh, that book just got released this week, and uh, anyone can get an advanced copy of the book. It's not yet in bookstores, but anyone can get an advanced copy of this book uh, by making a donation of any amount to reasons to believe. And uh, they'll ship it in to you anywhere uh, in the, the world. And uh, also, uh, there's material in this book, The Creator and the Cosmos, fourth edition. Uh, that is available generally, and anyone can get a free chapter of that book at reasons.org slash Ross. Uh, but what I wanna do is give you the, in this talk uh, uh, this afternoon, is give you the motivation for me writing the book Design to the Core. And it basically was the response of atheist scientists to this book, The Crater and the Cosmos. It's my best-selling book, and this is now in the fourth edition. And uh, I've got a little bit there on how atheists have been responding to the evidences for the supernatural design of our universe. Uh, but there's been some advances since then. And so what you'll see in the initial chapters of Design to the Core is basically my saying, here's my motivation for writing the book. I see a need to respond to the latest atheist attempts to discount the fine-tuning argument uh, for God. And the fine-tuning argument for God has been the traditional first scientific uh, approach uh, that the church has used to establish that the God of the Bible exists. And uh, this has been the case for the past 2,000 years. And so when everybody asks me, okay, what is the predominant evidence that's being put forward scientifically to establish the existence of God? It's the fine-tuning argument. And if you were to go upstairs in this building to my office here at Reasons to Believe, you'll see I've got about 50 books written on the design of the universe. And all but two of those books are written by astronomers and physicists who are not uh, Christians. Uh, and the evidence today in the words of the agnostic astronomer Paul Davies has now become such that it's overwhelming. Uh, what he says in his book, The Cosmic Blueprint, the evidence for design in the universe is overwhelming. And what we've been doing at Reasons to Believe uh, since 1990 is surveying the scientific literature and building a database of features of the universe and the laws of physics that uh, reveal a greater degree of fine-tuning design 
than anything that we human beings are capable of. Basically making the point that we look at the fine-tuned uh, evidences, fine-tuned designs we see in the universe to make life possible, uh, we see a level of design that's far greater than anything we human beings have ever been able to achieve, basically making the point the creator of the universe must be a personal being, just like we humans are, uh, but is a personal being whose orders and orders of magnitude more intelligent, more knowledgeable, and more powerful than we human beings. And uh, this gives you uh, a quick survey of our research since 1990, going through the scientific literature and noticing that you see a revelation of the biblical principle in the book of Job and Psalms. What you see in Job and Psalms, the more we learn about nature, the more evidence we uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God. And when we published our first uh, article on this back in 1991, we noted that there were 17 different features of the universe and the laws of physics that showed a level of fine-tuned design that was greater than anything we human beings are capable of manifesting. And in some cases, the degree of fine-tuning was trillions and trillions and trillions of times greater than anything we human beings are capable of manifesting. But what we did since 1991 is continue that research to demonstrate that the more we learn about the universe, uh, the more evidence we find for the supernatural handiwork of God. So when we put out our second update in 1995, just four years later, uh, we were able to assemble 26 known features of the universe that displayed this very high level of fine-tuning design. And you can see the updates in 2001, 2004, 2006. Uh, one in 2009 that I didn't put up here is actually on our reasons.org website. If you go to reasons.org slash fine tuning with a hyphen or without the hyphen, it doesn't matter, it'll pop up for you a 300 page long online uh, database of cosmic fine tuning. Uh, and basically making the point that indeed the more we learn, uh, the more evidence we accumulate. And the 300 page compendium is that long because we actually give you all the papers in the scientific literature where this evidence is documented. And so today, uh, the evidence stands above 200 known features uh, that must be fine-tuned. And as you can see there at the bottom of the slide, reasons.org slash fine-tuning, you get a list of the features and you get the citations of the scientific literature. And you also get calculations of the degree of fine-tuning we're seeing, basically making the point someone far more intelligent, knowledgeable, and powerful who transcends the laws of physics and the space-time dimensions must have created the universe. And what I want to devote the remainder of uh, my talk this Sunday is looking at how uh, non-theists, the agnostics, uh, the deists, and the atheists in the scientific community have responded to this. And they basically have come up with four critiques of the idea that the fine-tuning stands as evidence uh, for the God of the Bible. The first one is that there's been a transformation of these books on the anthropic principle. I probably should give you a definition. The anthropic principle uh, is the idea that when we look at the universe, we see that it has fi highly fine-tuned parameters, numerous parameters that must be extraordinarily fine-tuned to make possible the existence of humans or the equivalent of humans to exist in the universe. And again, if you look at the 50 books that are in my office, you do notice that there's an evolution in those books. The earliest books that were being published in the 1970s and the 1980s basically talked about the fine tuning that's necessary to get the equivalent of human beings to exist in the universe. But as you move from the 1980s to the 1990s and into the 21st century, you see that these books have changed and where they, instead of arguing for the fine-tuning for the equivalent of humans, they argue for the fine-tuning 
of what you ne need to get to have microbes. And to have microbes, you have a whole lot less fine tuning. I mean, you see that in the 300 page compendium on our website, that the degree of fine tuning uh, for humans is orders and orders of magnitude greater than what you need to get a planet, for example, on which you have bacteria. Uh, but the latest books uh, that are being uh, published uh, by non-Christian astronomers and scientists, they're basically promoting the prebiotic anthropic principle. And that's what you see in the latest scientific papers on the anthropic principle. They're basically talking about what design do we need in the universe in order to have a universe in which you have amino acids and uh, nucleobases and sugars. We're not even talking what you need to get proteins and uh, you know, DNA molecules, RNA molecules, and lipids. They're simply saying, what kind of fine tuning do we need? And so the strategy here by the unbeliever is to redefine the anthropic principle so the level of fine tuning is many, many orders of magnitude less spectacular, and therefore they're claiming maybe we don't need the God of the Bible if the only objective is to get a universe uh, with uh, the capability of having amino acids, nucleobases, and sugars. Matter of fact, the latest papers I'm seeing, they actually go down to a level. What do we need to get the molecules that would make possible uh, the assembly of, uh, you know, say, hydrogen, uh, cyanide, carbon dioxide, and methane, uh, where you can get these amino acids? So now they're talking, what do we need to get the building blocks of the building blocks of the building blocks of the life molecules of uh, RNA, DNA, uh, the lipids, uh, and uh, the proteins? And uh, this was called uh, up in the scientific literature uh, by an agnostic astronomer, a Brazilian agnostic astronomer. If you ever go to Brazil, uh, this gentleman, Marcelo Gleiser, <coughs> He's considered to be the Carl Sagan or the Neil deGrasse Tyson of Brazil. So he's a household name all over Brazil. But he actually published several papers exposing uh, this evolution in the anthropic principle. Now, I've actually got to meet Marcelo. I met him when I was at uh, Yale University. And uh, he calls himself an agnostic, but he says, really my motivation is to expose the philosophical uh, games that are being played and why people are really not looking at the true evidence for fine tuning in the universe. And I found that he's really passionate about this fine tuning argument and does agree the fine tuning is indeed orders of magnitude greater uh, to get the equipment of human beings as opposed to getting bacteria or even just to get the building blocks of the building blocks of uh, life molecules. But that's one approach that's been undertaken uh, by uh, non-Christians in the scientific community in an attempt to minimize uh, this evidence of the fine-tuning design uh, for the God of the Bible. One that's become quite popular in the past few years is the puddle analogy. And, uh, especially the last two years, this has been popping up in the scientific literature. Books have been written on this. And it's basically making the point there really isn't any fine-tuning evidence. Uh, all this fine-tuning to get life or to get human beings uh, is the same thing as if you were a pool of water in a puddle, and as a pool of water you look out and say, oh, this uh, puddle is perfectly designed uh, for me to fit into it. And therefore, they say it's simply a fallacy. Is that you know any uh, you know we we're just saying hey it's fit for us. Well hey we're here and we're drawing a conclusion. Uh, but there's been a paper published uh, by a Christian astronomer and he actually his co-author is an atheist astronomer. Uh, but they were the ones that exposed the fallacy here, saying, well. Any hole in the ground or any hole in the pavement or any hole in a pool of gravel uh, will do for a puddle. I mean, after all, the water is a liquid. Uh, liquid will fill any kind of cavity 
uh, that doesn't matter what kind of cavity it is. It's a liquid and it will fit. But it says life is not like a liquid. Uh, whereas any old hole will do for a puddle and the water will always fit uh, the hole that it's in, no matter what configuration the hole takes, that's not true of physical life. Not any old universe will do for physical life. That's the core of the fine-tuning argument, that you need a highly fine-tuned universe in order for any kind of light to be possible, even just bacterial light to be possible. So whereas any hole will do for a puddle, it's not true that any universe will do for physical life. And that's what you see in all the books uh, written on the anthropic principle, regardless of the philosophical perspective of the author. Uh, they all recognize that it takes a highly fine-tuned universe for any kind of physical life uh, to exist. Now, personally, I've been speaking on the fine-tuning argument of the universe as an argument for the existence of God uh, since the 1970s. And it was in the 1980s uh, when we launched Reasons to Believe and I began speaking to university audiences and dealing with skeptics uh, who were trying to challenge me that this uh, evidence in the universe points to the God of the Bible. Uh, they began to uh, suggest, well, that's for this universe. What of their other universes? So I remember back in the 1980s, particularly when I spoke on university campus is saying, just watch. Notice that I've published an article. I've been doing this now for 37 years. Articles at reasons.org called Today's New Reason to Believe. And I'm basically bringing out an article like that on a basis of once a week. In fact, every Monday morning, I do my best to post an article <coughs> drawing from the latest scientific literature saying here is even more evidence for the God of the Bible than we had just a week ago. Again, demonstrating that principle in Job and Psalms. The more we learn about the universe, the more evidence we see uh, for the God of the Bible. And I've been telling audiences since the 19, uh, early 1980s, if we had the time at Reasons to Believe, we could publish several articles per day that's how much is being published in the scientific literature. I remember back in the 1980s telling audiences, <coughs> eventually, the accumulating evidence for fine-tuned designs in the universe will become so overwhelming that atheists will have nowhere else to go but to hypothesize that there's an infinite number of universes where every universe is different from every other universe and they're going to argue we happen to be just in the lucky universe out of that infinite number. And uh, about 20 years went by. But I remember in the early uh, 2000s that that's exactly what happened. The evidence had become so overwhelming, so compelling, that uh, atheist scientists began appealing to this infinite number of universes as a way to escape the conclusion that the God of the Bible was the one that designed the universe for the benefit of life and for us human beings in particular. And it goes by the name the multiverse. And I imagine almost everyone here in the audience has heard of the multiverse, right? How many of you have ever heard of the multiverse? Okay, it's ubiquitous now. Uh, and typically when I engage atheists, astronomers, and physicists, that is their argument against the God of the Bible. They will say, well, there could be an infinite number of universes, and they're all different from one another. Isn't it possible we happen to just live in the lucky one universe? Now, what I've done in the Crater and the Cosmos fourth edition is to give a negative refutation of the multiverse and a positive refutation. And it goes on for, gee, seven or eight pages. What I'm going to try to do is highly abbreviate it uh, for you in this message. And I want to give credit to the negative argument. It was first proposed uh, by the atheist, uh, you know, theoretical uh, physicist Leonard Susskind, although occasionally he refers to himself as an agnostic. But he was the one years ago who said, we atheists have got to stop using the multiverse. It explains everything. 
an argument that explains everything explains nothing. It's a bad argument. We need to stop using it. Notice atheists still use it, but it's like what I said in the 1980s. They've got nowhere else to go. Uh, it's the only argument they've got left. <coughs> so, now, Leonard Susskind made that statement years ago. What I did in the Creator and the Cosmos 4th edition is to give an illustration of the point that he was making, that it explains everything, therefore it explains nothing. And so if you have an infinite number of universes that are all different from one another, and it's a true infinity, then you get infinities of infinities. And so in that uh, multiverse, you'll actually have an infinite number of planets that will be almost identical to planet Earth. And on those infinite number of planet Earths, you're going to have an infinite variety of birch trees. And birch trees have the property that they peel thin white pieces of bark. Well, if you've got an infinite variety of birch trees, one of those species of birch trees will peel thin rectangular pieces of white bark that measure eight and a half by 11 inches. <coughs> Excuse me. And these pieces of rectangular uh, white thin pieces of uh, birch bark will randomly fall on random soils that'll make random markings on those pieces of white birch bark. And those random markings will duplicate every figure, diagram, equation, sentence, and every scientific paper uh, written uh, since the beginning of uh, the human species. Which means when we look at all those scientific research papers uh, in the published literature, they didn't come from the mind of scientists. The multiverse did it. And so the argument that these atheists are using to say the God of the Bible didn't do the design, the multiverse did it, that same argument can be used to say there are no human designs. The multiverse is responsible for all the pieces of art, uh, photography, scientific papers, books, plays, movies. The multiverse did it all. We humans had no role in it at all. And we're basically making the point that Leonard Susskind made, if you're going to appeal to the multiverse, you're trapped into a philosophical inconsistency. The same argument eliminates all human designs, just like eliminates God's design. Now, I complemented that in the Creator and the Cosmos 4th edition with a positive argument, that if the atheist is right, that all this fine-tuned design we see in the universe is simply the product of pure chance, then as we continue to study the universe in greater and greater extent and depth, that means that the evidence for fine-tuned design to make possible the existence of life and humans in particular, at some point is going to decline. It's going to stabilize and then it's going to decline. But if indeed this is the handiwork of a personal creator that's very intelligent, knowledgeable, and transcends the universe and created the universe, then we would anticipate that as we learn more and more about the universe, this evidence for fine-tuned design will become greater and greater and greater. And as we've already demonstrated, that's been the testimony uh, since the early 1990s. The more we've learned about the universe, the evidence for fine-tuned design for the specific benefit of us human beings has getting exponentially greater. It's not just getting greater, it's getting exponentially greater with every year uh, that goes by. Well, the last one I want to deal with is the critique that we're dealing with a sample size of one. Because what you'll see in my fine-tuning compendium at reasons.org is I'm making a statistical argument. Uh, but skeptics of Christianity have said, when you're working with the universe, you're working with a sample size of one. Now, it's true that atheists who appeal to the multiverse are appealing to an infinite number of universes. But that appeal is an appeal to the unknown. Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us that once the universe gets old enough to have even the simplest forms of life, uh, then uh, observers within that universe will be unable to detect anything beyond 
the space-time dimensions of the universe. And so today in the 21st century, we know with extreme certainty that general relativity reliably describes the movements of massive bodies in the universe uh, to about 15 to 16 place of the decimal. In fact, general relativity today stands as the best proven principle in all of physics, which means we can be extremely confident, and this is something both atheists and Christian scientists agree on, is that we are limited scientifically to only being able to explore this universe. If there are other universes, if God made a trillion other universes, there's no way uh, using our science we can detect the existence of those other universes. We're limited to the universe in which we live, which means if you're going to make an argument uh, for the fine-tuning of the design of the universe, you're dealing with a sample size of only one. And so that's a major critique of the cosmic anthropic principle. But once again, if you were to go up to my library in this building and look at my 50 books in the anthropic principle, you'll notice that the books written by the non-Christian scholars, they stop at the level of the universe. And it's such that uh, if you look at the books on the anthropic principle, there's a general agreement that yes, the design is overwhelming, it's ubiquitous, it points to something beyond the universe. And uh, I find very few scientists uh, when I speak at government labs or university campuses or research facilities that would disagree with that. And people often ask me, how is it that atheists seem to be comfortable with this and agnostics and deists? My response is, if we're talking about the fine tuning of the universe, the universe is extremely big and extremely old, and that permits the non-Christian research scientists to keep God at an arm's length. We're talking this distant universe. We're talking a sample size of only one. And what I'm reading in the latest books being put out by atheist astronomers and physicists, they will state in their books that they're atheists. But they also concede in their same books that they cannot take deism off the table. I mean, for example, you can read the books by Lawrence Krauss, who's probably the most famous atheist scientist here in America. And uh, he makes that concession uh, in his book, A Universe from Nothing, uh, that scientifically we can't take deism off the table. Uh, the door is open uh, for a God beyond the universe being the one that created the universe. But he's comfortable with that because in deism, you've got a God that intervenes 13.8 billion years ago, and after that, basically ignores his creation. That's kind of the difference between deism and theism. In deism, you've got a God beyond space and time that creates 13.8 billion years ago, sets everything in motion, and then ignores his creation. Theists, on the other hand, believe that God indeed was active in creating the universe 13.8 billion years ago, uh, but has been miraculously engaged with his creation continuously throughout those 13.8 billion years. But if you've got a God that ignores what he created over the past 13.8 billion years, it's basically a God that doesn't care how we live our lives, doesn't really care about anything that exists in the universe. And therefore, philosophically, uh, the existence of this God is basically immaterial uh, to how we live and shape our lives. And so what I want to do next week is basically say why I wrote uh, Design to the Core is say, okay, we have this general concession amongst research scientists that when we look at the universe, we see overwhelming evidence for design but we can't make a statistical case for God because we only have one universe to investigate. And so what I'm going to be doing next week is basically saying, yes, the evidence in astronomy tells us we live in a highly fine-tuned universe, but we actually live in a highly fine-tuned uh, super galaxy cluster, a highly fine-tuned galaxy cluster, a highly fine-tuned galaxy group, a highly fine-tuned galaxy, 
highly fine-tuned star, highly fine-tuned planetary system, highly fine-tuned set of planets, a highly fine-tuned set of asteroid and comet belts, highly fine-tuned Earth, highly fine-tuned Moon. We look at our planet Earth, the atmosphere is fine-tuned, the hydrosphere is fine-tuned, uh, the crust is fine-tuned, the asthenosphere, the mantle, the liquid core, the inner core. Everywhere we look at all size scales, we see fine-tuning. And now we're not looking at a sample size of one. I mean, how many galaxies exist in the universe? Well, in the observable universe, which is smaller than the actual universe, we see about two trillion galaxies. So now we can look at our galaxy, and if it has extraordinarily fine-tuned features that we don't see in any of the other two trillion galaxies, we no longer can be refuted by saying, your sample size is too small. Two trillion galaxies is a big sample size. And of course, when we get to our star, you've got an even bigger sample size. There are a trillion trillion stars in the universe, and about 10 trillion trillion planets in the universe. So now we're getting very large sample sizes. So what I'm going to be revealing to you, and what's in the book Design to the Core, is that when we move from the universe as a whole, and step by step go closer and closer to planet Earth, going from our super galaxy cluster to our galaxy, all the way in uh, to uh, this Earth itself, we see that on every size scale, there's overwhelming evidence for fine-tuned design to make our existence possible. And the closer we get to our planet, the greater the degree of fine-tuning evidence we see. And in terms of the sample size, the sample size gets bigger and bigger as we approach the Earth. And so the argument uh, from fine-tuning for God actually becomes potently, uh, exponentially uh, more powerful as we move from the universe as a whole and move in uh, to uh, the surface of the Earth. And here we're dealing with large sample sizes. And if indeed we see this design on all cosmic size scales, I'm arguing this exponentially strengthens the fine-tuning, the design argument uh, for the God of the Bible. So, and by the way, I'm not going to take you through the whole book. We're just going to hit a few highlights because I want to keep this series relatively short. I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's probably going to be between uh, five and uh, eight weeks total that we'll get through this. And if you want a more detailed story, you've got to go out and get the book and say anyone can get the book now uh, for a donation of any amount uh, to Reasons to Believe. So with that, and hey, I ended right on 30 minutes. So I did good on that, right? So uh, I'll take questions, and as usual, I'll take questions on any topic. It doesn't have to be uh, just what we talked about uh, this afternoon. And we'll alternate between people that are here in person and the people that are uh, joining us uh, through YouTube Live. Anybody have a question? I have a couple of online questions. Okay, let's go for the online questions. Thank you something, just raise your hand. Uh, Here's one. And yeah, give me the name first if you can. Well, this one's 00900 Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that helps a lot. <laughs> okay. What are, the chances, <laughs> what are the chances that there is advanced life outside the observable universe? Well, I have a section early on in the book about the difference between the actual universe and the observable universe. And uh, when we look through our telescopes, we do not see the universe as it exists today because it takes time for light to travel to our telescopes. So what we astronomers see is the universe of the past, and the universe is expanding. And so when we look out through our telescopes, the farthest we can look is 13.8 billion light years away because that's the age of the universe. Uh, however, the universe has been expanding throughout those 13.8 billion years, and our measurements of the cosmic expansion rate tell us, at a minimum, the universe must be about 96 billion light years across. That's the universe of today. So the universe of today is substantially larger than the universe we can see through the telescope. However, 
As we look through the telescope at the universe of the past, we see two things. Number one, the universe on the very largest scales is homogeneous and uniform. And that homogeneity and uniformity are crucial to have life in the universe and actually must be fine-tuned. If the universe is too uniform, there's no possibility for physical life. But if it's not uniform enough, there's no possibility for life. Same thing on the homogeneity. If it's too homogeneous, no possibility for life. But if it's not homogeneous enough, there's no possibility for life. But very approximately, the universe measures to be uniform and homogeneous. And for light to be possible, those characteristics would also have to apply to the universe of the present, not just the universe that we can observe, the universe of the past. The second data point we get is that when we look in detail, and you'll see a lot of this in the book Designed to the Core, particularly when I talk about galaxies and galaxy clusters, we can observe galaxies, for example, 10 billion light years away, which means we're seeing their characteristics as they were 10 billion years ago. But those characteristics we see actually are a very good predictor of what that same galaxy looks like today. So we actually have a lot more power than lay people think. Even though we're looking at galaxies uh, as they were 5 billion years ago, 10 billion years ago, uh, what we see in those galaxies actually is a good predictor of what the galaxies look like today. And therefore, uh, even though we're limited to the observable universe, that does tell us a lot about the universe that we're not able to see. And kind of the point I'm making in uh, Design to the Core, if you actually look at the fine-tuned design evidence on the largest size scales in all possible size scales all the way down to the interior of the Earth, it does make a compelling case that in terms of a habitat uh, where advanced life, the equivalent of us human beings, could exist, it seems highly probable that we are alone. Everywhere else we look in the universe, we see conditions that are hostile for advanced life. That doesn't eliminate microbial life. There are many astronomers who do believe that there might be a place where microbes could exist, especially if we're talking microbes uh, that exist for just a short period of time. But this is where our book, Origins of Life, comes in, because we make the point in the book, Origins of Life, no matter how big the universe is, no matter how old it is, in order for life to be there, you need the supernatural intervention of the God of the Bible. Life cannot come from non-life. Yes? Uh, seeing the, the fact that astronomers look back into the past, does that mean that Andromeda is much, much closer to crashing into the Milky Way than what we observe? It's a little bit closer. I mean, yeah, the, the question is uh, the Andromeda galaxy, we're seeing it as it was in the past, and it's actually on a, a collision path towards uh, our own Milky Way galaxy. Presently, is it closer to us than what we see through the telescope? And the answer is yes. Uh, it is on a path towards, it's not on a direct path, it's kind of a little bit off uh, 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 directly uh, colliding with us. But it's such that the gravity of our galaxy and the gravity of the Andromeda galaxy are such that that path that it's taking is going to bend and head right towards our Milky Way galaxy. A collision is inevitable. However, astronomers have been able to calculate an estimated date for the merging of our Milky Way galaxy with the Andromeda galaxy. It's about four to four and a half billion years, about four and a half billion years into the future that that event will take place. The Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away. And so uh, what we see through the telescope in terms of its distance, it's actually a little bit closer if we actually think about where that Milky Way galaxy is today. Uh, but not a whole lot closer. Uh, question online here. Um, Mark Wilburn, uh, he's got a couple of questions. But one is, uh, 
He's gotten pushback about Revelation 21 and there not being a sun or moon ver verses. They are not needed, but they are still present along with the entire universe. Back on? Okay. Yeah. I've written about Revelation 21 extensively in my book, uh, Beyond the Cosmos, in its third edition. And you'll find a briefer description also in why the universe is the way it is. And yes, it tells us uh, that in Revelation 21, there will not be a sun, there will not be a moon. Uh, and it also tells us it's a realm where nothing will decay, nothing will die. Uh, there'll be no shadows, there'll be no darkness. And I interpret that as telling us that it's going to be a completely different realm than this universe. Uh, because this is a universe that has pervasive decay. The laws of thermodynamics operate everywhere in the universe. Electromagnetism operates everywhere in the universe. And Revelation 21 uh, seems to indicate it's going to be a realm without electromagnetism, and without thermodynamics, and also describes this new Jerusalem coming down and resting on the new earth. And it gives us the dimensions of that new Jerusalem, roughly 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, and it's got corners. And uh, such an object would violate the law of gravity. Uh, gravity in our universe is such that any body bigger than about 300 kilometers across uh, gravity will actually squish that into a spherical shape. And so the New Jerusalem apparently violates the law of gravity. And this is also consistent with what it says in Romans 8.23, uh, that there's this pervasive law of decay that will remain in effect until the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have been redeemed, which would seem to indicate that's when the universe uh, will cease to exist. And you've got two passages in the book of Isaiah and a passage in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 that make the point that uh, the universe in the future will fulfill the purpose for why God created it. And when that purpose has been fulfilled, as God spoke the universe into existence, he'll speak it out of existence. In Isaiah and 2 Peter, it says that God's going to roll up the universe like a scroll and it's going to disappear uh, into a fiery heat. <laughs> Which, as an astronomer tells me, it seems to be stating that the universe is going to disappear into a singularity. It came from a singularity, apparently it's going to disappear uh, into a singularity, and it's going to be replaced by a brand new realm. And I've written the reason why and why the universe is the way it is. That thermodynamics, gravity, and electromagnetism are important laws of physics that are critical for efficiently eradicating evil. God is using those laws of physics to eradicate evil once and for all while he enhances the free will of uh, people who desire to spend eternity with him. And so uh, once the full number of human beings has been redeemed, uh, God no longer has a need for the universe or its laws of physics. We enter into a new realm. In my opinion, that explains why there's no sun or moon. If you've got different laws of physics, you can't have bodies like the sun and the moon. I think the new earth is going to be radically different than this earth. But if you want details, uh, get the book Beyond the Cosmos. Okay, Norm. Uh, hi, you. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, concerning the James Webb Telescope, what data do you think is going to, that we, will be collected or what will, new knowledge will we ob obtain that will either support the, uh, uh, the theory uh, of the Big Bang description of the universe or, or deny that description? What is it that we're going to learn that will most forcefully do one or the other? Right. Well, I've written extensively on the Big Bang creation model in particular in the fourth edition of The Crater and the Cosmos, basically making a point. Every test we've thrown at the Big Bang, uh, that model has passed it spectacularly. And so every measurement, every observation is consistent with the universe 
coming from a space-time beginning uh, by the hand of a causal agent beyond space-time matter and energy. Now, that does not mean that the Big Bang creation model has been put to an exhaustive test. And so one of the objectives of the James Webb Telescope is to test the biblically predicted cosmic creation model in places where we've not been able to put it to the test. And uh, one of those places is looking at what happens to galaxies in the very earliest moments of the universe and the firstborn stars. So one of the big objectives of the James Webb Telescope is to discover and measure the spectra of the very firstborn stars in the universe and likewise to see how the first galaxies form. Now, already we have the telescope power to get a rough idea about the firstborn stars because we've seen uh, small firstborn stars. But the thing about star formation, the smaller the star, the longer it takes to form and the longer it takes to burn through its nuclear fuel. The big stars uh, will go through it quite rapidly. In fact, the rate of burning of a star goes up with a fourth power of the mass of the star. So stars that are, say, 50 times the mass of our star, the sun, they will go through their nuclear fuel in three million years or less. In fact, astronomers believe there are some stars that go through their nuclear fuel in less than a million years. So they burn up very quickly. But small stars that are, say, less than the mass of our star, the sun, they take millions of years to begin their nuclear burning. Uh, they go through what's called the pre-main sequence, where they're basically coalescing and on the way to becoming a star. And uh, that means that the smaller stars are going to be polluted by the ashes of exploded big firstborn stars uh, while those stars are still forming. They haven't even started their nuclear burning yet. But because they take tens of millions of years to form, uh, they get polluted by the really big firstborn stars. And we've already seen, even in our own galaxy, uh, tiny firstborn stars. But we've not been able to see the big ones. Because to see the big ones, because they explode, see the small ones, uh, they actually take a trillion years to go through their nuclear fuel. So we can still see them in the present. We can't see the firstborn big stars because they go through their fuel so quickly uh, that, hey, less than a million years, the only way you're going to be able to detect those stars during their burning phase if you can look 13.6 billion light years away. Because you've got to catch them while they're still burning, not when they're burnt out. When they're burnt out, you're not going to be able to detect them. And uh, we can see galaxies 13.5 billion light years away, but we can't see individual stars. James Webb was designed with the primary mission to be powerful enough to see those firstborn stars. That's another reason why they made it an infrared telescope and not an optical wavelength telescope, because when you look billions of light years away, the light is redshifted. And so the anticipation is those firstborn stars looking at them 13 billion, 13.6 billion light years away are going to be highly redshifted. And so they purposely made the James Webb Space Telescope an infrared telescope so they could see those firstborn stars at the wavelength where they're going to be the brightest. So that's a major goal, uh, not only to detect those stars, but to measure a spectrum and determine what their composition is because a fundamental prediction of Big Bang cosmology is that the universe, its first stars, will only have hydrogen and helium and a trace amount of lithium. And we've yet to detect a star uh, that has that signature. Every star we've detected has those elements plus the ashes of elements made from previous generations of stars. And so that's a primary goal. But another goal, uh, Big Bang cosmology makes some predictions about how the first galaxies will form. Basically mergers of the mini galaxies to become larger galaxies. Actually some of that's already been observed with ground-based telescopes, but the James Webb will be able to discern that in greater detail. However, what might delay all that, a lot of astronomers 
want to use the James Webb Telescope to measure the spectra of the atmospheres of planets uh, beyond our solar system. And uh, that's going to take a lot of telescope time. So it may be a while before we actually see the spectra of those first-born stars. But it's scheduled, so uh, just be patient. And yeah, I'm predicting that it's going to, again, see the Big Bang model that's consistent with the Bible teaches being proven, not just uh, from what we've done so far. James Webb is going to add even more evidence. And I'll keep you posted. As soon as they start publishing articles, whether it's against the Big Bang or for the Big Bang, I'll tell you what's going on. But I'm predicting the Big Bang's going to pass with flying colors. Okay. Um, you just answered Supernova's question, too. Uh, Doug McComb has a question. How do we know, apart from the scripture, that the laws of physics could be different than they are here in supposed hypothesized other universes? Well, we can't tell about other universes because we can only make measurements in the universe that we're in. Uh, we do know God made other realms. So the idea that the universe is all there is or was or ever will be, uh, Carl Sagan's famous uh, mantra, uh, we know from the Bible that's not true. And actually we know from the space-time theorems that can't be true because a causal agent uh, must exist beyond the space-time dimensions of the universe. So, uh, uh, but we can use measurements to determine whether or not the laws of physics indeed are constant everywhere in the universe, uh, everywhere in geography and everywhere in time. Uh, because when we look at the spectra of distant stars and different galaxies, uh, that spectral information actually tells us what's happening with the laws of physics. And there's a number of articles that I've written at reasons.org uh, where these tests have been done, uh, looking at the fine structure constant, the gravitational constant, uh, the ratio of the electromagnetic charge to the proton charge. That's just some examples of laws of physics we can measure uh, in stars and galaxies. We can measure the velocity of light. And uh, all those measurements tell us Going back, well, in the case of the velocity of light, we're able to confirm it's constant over the past uh, 13.4 uh, billion years. So we've actually measured the velocity of light in galaxies 13.4 billion uh, light years away, and it measured to be the same value that we measure in the lab. So, and we've been able to do that with several different constants of physics. So we can do that back in time, and we can also do it ubiquitously across the space of the universe. And that's something the Bible declared thousands of years ago, that the laws that govern the heavens and the earth are fixed. As they don't change, uh, God doesn't change. God actually used that as an example of his immutability. See those laws, as they don't change, I don't change. But we can actually prove that uh, through astronomical measurements. You say, to what degree? Uh, we can show that the laws of physics are constant to within one part uh, per uh, sextillion uh, per year. So we're talking 18 places the decimal. Let's see. It looks like our audience is out of questions. But we have more online ones. Okay. Yeah, we can okay take uh, questions for another six minutes. Okay. Uh, Mark Wilburn again. Uh, address the argument from a scholar that Romans 8, 18 through 22 indicates the earth will be restored. Yeah, I'm not sure what he's referring to there in Romans 8, 18 to 22. It does talk about how <clears throat> the universe is governed by this law of corruption, as some English translations say, other translations of pervasive law of decay. So it's basically saying this law of decay operates everywhere in the universe. And verse 23 says, a time will come when that pervasive law of decay will no longer be in effect. And that will happen when the full number of humans that God intends to redeem have in fact been redeemed. But I personally see nothing in Romans 8 
that suggests that this planet Earth is going to be restored. Now, what you do see in the Bible, it talks about how our relationship with our Creator will be restored. A reference to the fact that Adam and Eve, before they sinned, uh, had a relationship with their Creator. But sin broke that relationship. And the death of Jesus on the cross restored that relationship. And the Holy Spirit's in the business of restoring that relationship with human beings who desire that restoration. And that work of reconciliation and restoration is ongoing by God uh, through this day. But Romans 18, 23 tells us it will eventually be finished. God has a set number of humans that he intends to redeem. And when that number has been reached, uh, then the universe will fulfill its purpose. Uh, so it's a spiritual restoration. And uh, I mean, you, a couple of years ago, we actually did a series here in Paradoxes where we looked at the debate. Is the earth going to be physically restored or are these Bible verses about restoration really referring to the spiritual restoration of humanity? And I'm arguing it's not referring to the physical, it's referring to the spiritual. And there's three verses in the Bible that have been cited as evidence for physical restoration, but they're overwhelmed uh, by more than a dozen Bible passages that explicitly state uh, that this universe will come to an end. The stars will come to an end. The sun will come to an end. Uh, the physical universe is going to vanish. It's going to disappear. It's going to be no more. Those are the words you see in the English translation. And uh, so you can scroll back uh, through the recordings that are available for download at reasons.org and actually uh, go through that series or uh, just pick up the Bible verses. I'd be, in fact, I did that with a class, basically gave an assignment. Go through your whole Bible and look at everything it talks about with restoration and about what's going to happen to the universe, the stars, and life here. That was paradoxes.org, right? Paradoxes.org yeah. okay. is where you'll find that. Um, here's a question from Doug about the uh, James Webb telescope. Uh, he wants to know when will it stop working and crash out of orbit? Well, it's not in orbit about the Earth. The James Webb telescope is at a Lagrange point in an orbit uh, of the Earth about the Sun. It's about a million miles away from the Earth, and they put it in a place where it's going to be stable uh, with respect to its position relative to the sun and the earth. And uh, they pick that as a place because, number one, they get more observing time. If it's orbiting the earth, uh, you're going to have the moon blocking out uh, uh, the sun. Uh, you, you, you get some disturbance. The Hubble Space Telescope was useful for about 23 hours a day. The James Webb Telescope is going to be useful for 24 hours a day. So it's going to make possible uh, research otherwise wouldn't be possible. The downside is, and actually there was an article published on the web yesterday saying there's already been one micrometeorite that's hit the James Webb telescope and there's some concern that micrometeorite damage could limit the lifespan of the James Webb Space Telescope. But the goal is that it will be maximally productive for at least a decade. That's the goal. Okay, we're at about the uh, stop time here. So uh, join us next week uh, when Ken Samples will be here uh, for part two of his series on uh, evidence for the resurrection. And if you missed part one, you can download it at paradoxes.org. Can you close us in I'll prayer? I'll close us in prayer, yes. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for every day. It's a privilege to live here on planet Earth and uh, to be a witness to what you've done, to receive from you uh, your grace, uh, your uh, love, your uh, life, and your truth. So open up our hearts. May we not close ourselves off to you and receive from you the knowledge, the wisdom, and understanding, and grace and love that you desire to pour upon us. And help us to share them with others we meet throughout this day, throughout this week, throughout this month. In Jesus' name, amen.